Welcome. I'd like to call to order this public hearing on preliminary determination to issue bonds, which will be followed by our regular board meeting. Um, Gary is going to give us an overview of the bond situation. So <clears throat> tonight we will hold a public hearing on the preliminary determination to issue the Series B $6 million bonds. <clears throat> we are holding this public hearing in accordance with Indiana Code 6-1.1-20-3.1. This public hearing is being held regarding the proposed Series 2021B $6 million bonds <clears throat> and the related project. Since the, since the <clears throat> branch project constitutes a controlled project. <clears throat> so we have provided copies of the draft notice to be published in the event the library adopts the final authorization for the 2021 B bonds. And we are providing it for members of the public now, as it includes all the information <clears throat> required to be available to the public during this public hearing, pursuant to the Indiana Code. <clears throat> so, some of the information that we will go over in this report uh, is the, the cost projection for the new branch, which we have here, roughly $12 million. And then uh, we will look at the library's cash balance, the tax rate history, the future operating fund surplus projections, a report on the pandemic's effect to the library's finances, a projection of branch operating costs, and a Baker Tilly report that shows the details of the bond terms and repayment. So this is the library's cash position at 1231-2020 and the total in the first column of $10,655,000. Uh, I just want to note that looking above that column, the rainy day fund and the LURF fund are close to six million dollars so that's a portion uh, of where we're getting the 12 million dollars for the project this rate uh, this chart i think we've all seen it before but um, it starts in 2011 when the tax rate was about 11 cents per hundred dollars of assessed value. Uh, and then since then, it has stayed at roughly the 10 cent range. And our, our plan going forward is to keep it at about that level. <clears throat> And this chart here, um, I would just draw your attention to the bottom of the first column. So for this sample of a residential property in Perry Township, this is uh, the tax bill. 
And at the bottom of the first column, you can see the 2.1122. So th that is saying that the tax rate is about $2.11 per $100 of assessed value. So on this sample, the gross assessed value is $250,000. So the, <clears throat> the tax on that at the bottom of the second column, you can see the 2,793.38. And out of that 2,793.38, the portion that is for the library is $128.15. So the purpose of this is just to put in perspective uh, on uh, the county tax rates for for Perry Township, what what some of the uh, other taxes are, and their size, and how they relate to the library tax. So here, um, the top part of the chart is, is um, it has to do with the pandemic impact on the library's budget. And we can see that in uh, <clears throat> quarter one of 2019 versus quarter one 2020, um, it went up about $8 million. So that, that three, $332,030 is actually $332 million. Uh, so first quarter went up by about eight million and throughout this year uh, we we were suspecting that uh, each we might have a drop in Indiana personal income over the course of 2020 compared to the previous year but it hasn't turned out that way um, in the first quarter, we're up by about eight million. Second quarter, we're up by about 22 million. Third quarter, we're up by about 20 million. The the uh, estimate for the fourth quarter is uh, for it to stay the same. Uh, that's kind of a worst case scenario. But even at that, the um, 2022 estimated growth quotient. Uh, is a little over 4%. So the uh, history of our surpluses, operating surpluses, uh, is below that, along with uh, the growth quotients for since 2013. And we can see that um, in 2022, which is the first uh, full year of branch operation at this point that we project, uh, we, we still have an operating fund surplus projected of a million dollars. And that is with branch operating costs included in that calculation. So branch operating cost projections, um, which is what this slide is about, <clears throat> the estimate is for the, um, for it to run in the 675 to 700,000 range uh, per year on the operating costs. And uh, we, we've, seen this report, it, it's been updated for this meeting. Uh, this is the Baker Tilly report with the details on the, um, the bond issue, $6 million. Um, just kind of going through some of these, which, and, and, and this is the one I guess uh, that I uh, think is the most important reports in, in this 
report. Um, this shows the total bond payments for the two bonds that will be issued this year, um, running about $900,000 a year. And then uh, this uh, translates that into a tax rate. Uh, so we can see that um, the rate for the debt levy, uh, we, the guideline is a penny. Uh, it gets slightly over a penny uh, in 2023, I think, 2024. And then as assessed value goes up, uh, it drops over the course uh, of, the, of the bond payment um, and is by 2026 uh, down to about nine-tenths of a cent. And then the last item in this packet is the notice uh, that would be issued uh, after the April meeting, uh, after we do the second public hearing. And um, so the interesting thing about this notice is that it does show our projected assessed value. You can see it going in 21 from 2021 from below eight billion to 2026, where it goes above nine billion. So, and now I would like to open it up for uh, any questions. Uh, if we have any members of the public here or any board members, uh, any questions? proposed bond do we have any online Greer with no uh, further questions or comments thank you Gary and we will adjourn the public hearing on preliminary determination to issue bonds and I will now immediately call to order our regular board meeting of the Monroe County Public Library Board of Trustees. <clears throat> uh, welcome again. We'll start by introducing ourselves. And if you care to share what you're reading, please do. Fred, you want to start us off? Hi, I'm Fred Reisinger. And uh, I'm reading a book about presidents right now. Uh, I taught history in high school and uh, at other places, and I enjoy that. Hi, I'm Christine Harrison, and um, actually, because of something I'm doing with my students after a break, I'm reading The Wizard of Oz. I'm Marilyn Wood, and I am reading uh, The Library Book by Susan Orlean. I think we've talked about this one before. It's very interesting, and it talks uh, um, primarily about the L.A. fire in 1987 at the public library. I'm John Walsh. I just finished uh, True Believer, The Rise and Fall of Stan Lee, a biography uh, by Abraham Reisman. Hi, I'm David Ferguson. I just finished A World Lit Only by Fire, which was about the Middle Ages. It was pretty interesting, but I just started Attics, which is about Crispus Attics and the uh, Oscar Robertson, et cetera. And that, even though I'm just a little bit into it, seems like a really good book, so recommended. Thank you, everyone. And our first item is the consent agenda. Do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda? <clears throat> we have a motion and a second to approve our consent agenda consisting of 
minutes, monthly financial report, monthly bills for payment, personnel reports, and our board meeting calendar. Are there any comments, questions, corrections on the consent agenda? Seeing none, all in favor of approving the consent agenda, uh, please say aye. aye. Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. And uh, any highlights you want to draw our attention to in the director's report, Marilyn? Um, just to uh, let everybody know that, yes, the library is reopened for browsing and technology use. That uh, started on February 22nd, and people are, are quite happy to be using the library again. Uh, there was a comment that was shared on Instagram or posted there, and, and this is it. I thought I would share with you. Oh, this was sweet. Our first time back inside MCPL in a year. They put together awesome reads and treats for this kid, but the best part was going inside. We've checked out a mini book this year, but being in the space, talking with the librarians and browsing, browsing was the best. A second home, we have missed our library time so much, maybe more than any other place. So one of the things that continues to grow is digital use. Uh, we hit uh, another new high uh, in the month of February, and we've been over uh, 100,000 uses uh, for four of the last six months. Um, in February, it was over 150,000. So I don't anticipate seeing that fall. Um, I think we're going to continue to see those sorts of trends and, and even uh, start to pick up on the physical side of things. So I think we're reaching uh, even more people right now, uh, which, is, which is fantastic news. Uh, and one of the other things, just to remind everybody that we're continuing to do in terms of meeting community needs, although we can't go to the jail in the way that we have in the past in the interactions, uh, we are still going there um, three days a week and curating mini book collections uh, for each cell block, and then they're delivered by the jail staff so they continue to receive reading materials and even uh, we still continue to get materials on request for specific titles or genres. So we're still out there. Any questions about the report? I have. Well, I know um, during the pandemic, at least once we increased uh, capacity with the digital mm -hmm. to accommodate that growing need. Have we had to do that more than that initial time? Do we? I'm going to let <clears throat> Greer answer that. That's a great question, John. We have not had to further increase. We actually scaled back a little bit with our Canopy subscription um, because we overreached in 2020 and, and we're more than meeting demand, so we were able to pull it back and still meet the demand. The Hoopla increases that um, were probably the most popular we've just kept in place and we plan to do so. so. Great, thank you. I have a question that um, in response to a uh, question that was posed to the board, um, with keeping things in quarantine when they're returned, do we see, do we have an idea of how long that will continue or is this just for the foreseeable future or do we have a plan to scale back on that at all? Or We're talking about it. I would say that, that most generally the, uh, we're trying to follow the science on it and so we'll look uh, to see what sort of uh, plans and, and what others are doing. It's, it, it's a little complicated for us in that we quarantine, um, be, materials are returned to us but don't go through our sorter. And because we have a sorter, if we sent materials through the sorter, then things could not be quarantined. So that's, the sorter is what removes the item from a person's account. And so we can't do it both ways effectively. Mm -hmm. We either quarantine or we don't. Mm -hmm. And so, and that leaves it attached to a person's um, account for a while. So it's not an answer to your question. Yeah, we're looking at it. It's likely to continue for a little while until mm -hmm. we get closer to that place where we, that we have a greater comfort level with the science. But, but at, at present, yes, we are still quarantining. Would you add anything to that, Greer? Yep, that's a real right here. The real complication is that when an item goes through the sorter, it checks the item in off the person's account and therefore makes it available to the public in our catalog. And if we're gonna check it in and it goes into quarantine, it's available but it's sitting in a room. And the potential for people not to be able to find what they're looking for, particularly our staff who are pulling items uh, for holds requests, just expands. 
So it's a lot simpler to say, the items don't get checked in, we quarantine for four days, or three if we wind up reducing, as Marilyn said, whatever the science uh, leads us to, is a cleaner way of doing it, even though sometimes it results in people asking, you know, why is this thing still on my account, even though I've left, I dropped it off a week ago. So, yeah. Any other questions on the director's report? Then um, we move on to Southwest Branch Design Development presentation and approval with Christine Matthew. And that Chris project's moving and Chris full Lord. steam ahead. We are. <clears throat> we closed on the property since our last meeting. We own it, and now we're closing in on the last phase of design. And you'll notice that we have finished boards that are over uh, be behind you, Chris and, and Fred. Um, and these are uh, samples of the, the finishes that we anticipate. Is this an action item? This is to move forward to construction documents, okay. yes. Technology, right? <laughs> I also, by the way, just finished the library book, and if you haven't read it, it is really fun. I mean, it's, it's not what you imagine it to be. Anyway, it's great fun. Um, okay, uh, we are here to um, basically say that we have completed the design development phase for the project, um, and the design development phase, uh, the submittals include uh, a large set of drawings, which I think are up in the boardroom upstairs, uh, along with a report, this volume, uh, along with a set of interior design finish boards that Marilyn mentioned. And then fresh off the press um, is the cost estimate uh, report for the project. Uh, most of you know the floor plans quite well, so what I'm going to do is just um, bring in some items that may have uh, evolved since you last saw schematic design. Um, starting with the site, I just wanted to point out uh, that the, in fact, Chris, maybe you can go to the screen and point out, okay, that'd be great. Um, some of the site amenities, support spaces that we have uh, now added to the site is a bicycle and scooter shelter uh, uh, as you come in from the west. There's a flagpole that's just um, right in the corner, right near there. And then as you travel further north, uh, there is the dumpster location, uh, as well as the transformer for the building up in that area as well. The parking lot uh, currently holds 56 spaces, the at-grade parking. 
Uh, that includes 50 visitor spaces, four ADA parking spaces, two ADA van spaces, and then in addition to that, there are two spaces for school buses to park up at the north edge of the lot. Um, you will see that on the east um, side of the building <coughs> is the amphitheater uh, located over there. You can see the dashed line. The dashed line is what demarcates the area that will be the alternate for the project. And for those of you who don't know what an alternate is, an alternate basically is a uh, a certain scope of work that will be added to the project or included with the project in the event that there are funds available. That means either that the bids come in lower than uh, we initially anticipated, that would be great, um, or there is a possibility of adding this work at another date or perhaps through a donation or a contribution by a community member to build this. But the, um, the amphitheater we will have at the, south, at the east side of the building, we do still have um, a, a little plaza entryway into the building right there into the southeast corner. And we do have a walkway that, that uh, travels north from that area. And that, and that shape provides the backbone, you might say, of the amphitheater. So well, even though the amphitheater is not there, the land will cascade down slope down into a bowl-like area, um, which means that you can still do an informal seating arrangement down there, but it just won't be a tiered seating area and there will not be any uh, lighting or uh, uh, any kind of power in that area. Those things are part of the alternate for the project. The, um, one of the things that we have been working with during the design development phase, and, and Bill Riegert with uh, Bledsoe Riegert, Cooper James is on Zoom with us right now in the event anybody has any questions. But one of the things that we've been working with the county on has been the storm drainage for the building, as well as the um, uh, location of the building in relation to the Gordon Pike improvements. If you look at the, um, uh, the building, running along the south edge of the building uh, is the new Gordon Pike area, which curves. It's a different shape than if you go out there today. Um, we have to make sure that the building, uh, what we build, will interconnect with the Gordon Pike uh, road improvements. So we have been working with, uh, uh, Bill's group has been working uh, uh, many, many hours trying to adjust the grading of the building so that it meets up eventually with the grading of the Gordon Pike area. Um, the Gordon Pike, project will be built after this project so that the walkways that come and connect between the building and the walkway along Gordon Pike, they will be part of the Gordon Pike development. They will not be put in because otherwise they would just be torn out and they'd be a temporary sidewalk. If you have any questions, please, um, as I said, Bill is here to answer them for you. We also have um, uh, issues with storm drainage. As I mentioned, um, we have an under, uh, ground uh, storm drainage system uh, detention area that will go under the parking lot to the west, as well as under um, the building uh, walkway area on the east side. Uh, the county currently is going through a change in their ordinances for storm, uh, uh, storm water control. And um, we just met with them maybe two weeks ago so this has been a new development and we are working with the county right now to make sure that what we do is acceptable to what they do, but we're kind of, we're a little ahead of them in terms of the ordinance. So uh, th there have been discussions about that. Okay, next one. Uh, yeah. Enter. Is it here? I don't know. I'll just okay, keep talking. Okay, we're, what's coming up on the screen are the, is the south elevation of the building. And this elevation is what you will see when you are traveling along Gordon Pike. It's kind of the most public face of the building. Um, what we have uh, is a tiered uh, seating study area that goes downhill, and Chris will point that out, the tiered seating, yeah. 
Uh, that is the area that will, uh, when you come in at the southeast entrance, you will come into a large atrium stair hall. And the landings in that stair hall will be study areas. So, as you, so you enter the building immediately from the southeast, and then you travel up through the building. The building exterior is composed of split-face limestone that you see, uh, that's the elevator area, uh, the base of the um, atrium stair, and that same um, uh, use of stone, natural stone material from this area wraps around the building and um, shows up at various key points on the elevations. Okay. Uh, the exterior of the building is composed of, in addition to the limestone, there are um, composite metal panels. They run along here. Uh, and then uh, there is, within that system of composite metal panels, there is curtain wall. And curtain wall is basically large window areas that are framed. And that's what you see. And that's what brings the light in from the south into the study uh, uh, tiered atrium. And it travels all the way through into the rest of the building because um, uh, that atrium uh, is something overlooked by the main floor of the building. Um, and then there are, um, uh, it's a metal panel, ribbed metal panel system that is the, uh, you might think of it as a field um, uh, ground relationships. Um, the metal panels are on the uh, rest of the building. Um, so it's a mix of limestone composite metal panels and ribbed metal panels uh, on the building. On the south side, on this particular elevation, there will be sunscreens um, that will provide shade along those windows on the atrium. And then as we travel on the west side and the east side of the building, we will have um, a silk screen glass, which will act as a light filter for those areas for basically light that's coming in quite low during the morning and towards sunset. It also acts as a deterrent uh, from birds coming into those windows. Okay. The roof is uh, composed of a rubber membrane roof. There are canopies on the building. Uh, then they mark the entrances to the building, uh, both at the southeast entry and as the main entry. Maybe we can see the other elevations now. Yeah. There we go. Just move and scoot it over. There we go. This is the um, west elevation as you approach the uh, building from the parking lot. Uh, this is the uh, west elevation of the building. Again, the limestone is on the north end of that elevation. Uh, the limestone, can you point out? Okay, limestone. And then we have the metal ribbed panels that compose the bulk of that elevation. And the canopies um, basically direct you in to the entrances and around to the front of the building. Next. Okay, that's good. Oops. This is the uh, north elevation. If you were standing in the woods or you were over at Bachelor and you could see through the woods, this would be the elevation that you see. There is a band that's like a bay window that projects out on the uh, north um, and east corner of the building. And that is basically where the children's area is located. There are big windows in there. Again, it's on the north side, so we can get a lot of natural light in that end without any concern for glare. Um, the windows that you see directly to the uh, west of that bay those are the uh, windows that go into the large meeting program room. And then there's a teen center. Uh, and then following that are windows that go into the staff lounge. Um, again, the building is composed of limestone at the west corner. And then the metal uh, ribbed panel system, horizontal panel system uh, for the bulk of the building. And then the bay window is com made up of the com uh, composite metal panels along with the curtain wall glass. Okay. Yes, sorry, that is the garage door. Um, if you came down from the upper uh, parking area, you come down and that garage door is a link garage door. It's an open garage area. 
Uh, we need to have it open, that, and we also have some windows openings. They're not glass, They're, uh, they have grills in them along the east side of the building, and that acts as a way of getting fresh air into the garage, and they work in conjunction with uh, two fans um, that are at the opposite end of the garage uh, to bring fresh air in and for us to meet um, ventilation requirements for the garage. Oops, come back there. Okay, that's good. This is the um, east um, side of the building. Uh, this is, as you know, the building sits on a hill, so these uh, windows are in the main uh, collections area of the building, um, and it is that wall is composed of glass as well as the composite metal panels on the building. Uh, and then it is uh, basically supported by a limestone veneer base and you can see those window openings, that's what goes into the garage and lets the fresh air come into the building. And then you can see on the right-hand side, north side, you can see where the bay wraps around the building and that serves as an area where the uh, children's area is located. And then on the uh, opposite side, the left side, south side, is the entry uh, coming in from the southeast area of the building. Okay. Okay, next. This is the lower level um, of the building, um, which shows you the parking layout. Uh, the parking in that area, there were 40 parking spaces in that area. Uh, and included with those, we have ADA van spaces, and we're right now trying to work out the van spaces and the car uh, ADA parking spaces on the lower level. We have, um, uh, the garage has allowed us to provide some additional support spaces for the library. On the west end of the garage, uh, that is the left side here, um, you can see the support spaces, which include a storage area for the library. We have the uh, mechanical room, electrical room, the IT support spaces, and there's a maintenance office down there as well. And then up in the upper right uh, corner, that is the northeast corner, the boiler room is located there, and that works well with the utilities uh, locations that are coming into the site. On the south side of the building is where we have the public accessing uh, the building. They can either come through the elevator, uh, right there's a little elevator lobby right there, or they can come through an entrance, which is down here, which either connects you to the stair that takes you up there, the atrium stair, or it can connect you to the site and let's say there's an event uh, in the amphitheater. You can park in the garage and you can go right through that spot, that, those doors, and have access immediately to the amphitheater. Okay. Hmm. Maybe you can. There we go, perfect. That's the one you want. Yeah, that's good. Okay, this is the main, main level of the building and you've seen enough of the main level and I'm not gonna go through all the spaces in the main level, but um, what I thought I would do is use this as the opportunity to speak about the uh, interior finishes for the building. We have, um, for, the, uh, uh, for the interior finishes, we've taken the theme of the setting of the building. We are in a, next to a wooded site we're in a natural uh, uh, setting uh, with a field in front of us um, and woods to the north and to the south, uh, to the east. And so we thought, why don't we take it, uh, uh, that theme and work it through the building? So the finishes that you see over here behind you um, are intended to be drawing on the natural colors and also uh, organic forms. Um, so that the uh, carpet, you can, uh, when you have a chance, maybe afterwards you can take a look, but um, the, uh, the doors in the building are all uh, natural maple hardwood veneer. Um, we have a vinyl plank flooring that ties in with that color scheme um, and uh, are wood-like in their appearance. We have the carpets, which bring in some of the natural colors, sort of a limey, 
uh, yellowy green mixed with uh, grays um, as a way of bringing in um, some natural colors. We also use a terracotta color. Uh, for instance, on the board to the right, you can see the children's area. Um, the children's program room has the terracotta um, vinyl sheet flooring, which is here. And then the main carpet in the children's area is the same as what is in the rest of the collections area, but it has a green theme, whereas the um, carpet in the collections area has a yellowy lime green. Um, okay. The walls throughout the building are painted, easier to maintain. Brian will be happy about that. Um, as I mentioned, doors are solid core maple veneer. Uh, the um, interior windows, there are lots of interior windows uh, which bring in both natural light from the outside, but they also share views within the building. And they are a hollow metal, uh, painted hollow metal uh, door and window frames on those. Um, the floor finishes are a mix of the, as I mentioned, the vinyl plank flooring, the carpet. There's also walk-off carpet near the entrances. And in the teaching kitchen and in the uh, restrooms, there are, uh, the floors are porcelain tile. Uh, the kitchen porcelain tile is one that is um, a slip proof, so there won't be any issues of uh, people falling. Casework is um, using the theme of uh, what looks like natural wood, but is actually a laminate. We have um, uh, casework made of uh, plastic laminate, which is easy to clean. Um, the countertops are either plastic laminate or in the case of, for instance, the kitchen area, we have the center island with the quartz, and in the bathrooms we have quartz as well. They tend to hold up uh, uh, stronger than the laminate. Um, signage throughout the building, we will, during this next phase coming up, start developing the signage for the building. And again, we're taking that same theme of the natural site as a, way, as a point of departure for the design. We were looking at uh, the lists of trees that the arborist put together when he did an evaluation of the woods, and we were starting to think about leaves as ways of naming rooms. Uh, maybe there's a way of starting to look at some directional signage that includes that, that theme throughout the building. We have, as I mentioned, just received the uh, project cost um, for the Southwest Branch, and we're happy to say that we are within the range of acceptable uh, budget right now. Um, the Blundell uh, Associates, who is acting as the cost estimator for the project, um, has uh, put together a site and building construction cost of $8,906,824 at this point. On top of that, there would be costs that are associated with a, with a construction contingency, which is separate from this that the library, we would um, uh, recommend the library carry 5% on top of that for things that might happen during construction. We also have, in addition to that, uh, costs that are related to things like furnishings, FF&E furnishings, um, the furniture, technology, security equipment, um, shelving, the collection itself, uh, and then uh, soft cost fees that are associated with the project and um, things like um, the cost to do soil borings. So that um, with all of those uh, together, we are currently in a cost uh, estimate range of between 11, I'm gonna round this up, 11.5 to $12.7 million for the entire project. And then on top of that would be the amphitheater and we have currently that one being costed at $157,000, $158,000. Any questions or anything that I have left out that you would like some information about? That's great. Everybody loves it. <laughs> Good. Okay, we're okay. Much. Good. I had a bunch of questions about the cost and the amphitheater, and you kind of covered all those uh -huh. uh, important things right at the end. Uh, are great. there other... Any questions from the board? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I guess I was curious then, the garage door then, is that the access to the parking garage from? Yes. So, okay. So and then there is, there is next to that garage door though, um, a man door so that um, 
you know, one really doesn't want people walking. You don't want pedestrians going through a garage door sure. if you can help. So we have a door right next to it okay. where you can access the garage through a regular um, steel painted steel door okay. and on that side of the building. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. And uh, I have a question. Um, so we estimated, you know, we're planning about 12 million for the project and everything you just went over came, you know, between 11 and 12 million. Are there any other expenses associated with the new branch that are not being talked about here? Not for, not for opening day, I guess mm -hmm. I'd say. Mm -hmm. Where the project costs would include all of the furnishings, collections, and everything to get it open, equipment. Also in this cost, I should mention, is also the land acquisition is in that number also? Yes. So, yeah. I have so. a question. One of the things, the way we designed this library is with two entrances, it takes a lot of staff to run the library, so you can't be open additional hours without spending a lot of man hours. So for this branch, what's the minimum number of personnel that it can be operated with? Yeah, we, um, we, we talked about three people uh, just for the various areas and, and security kinds of things. Um, we'll keep looking at that number, but it's not anything close to this one. You're right. I mean, right. with the, the, in fact, one of our, one of our, uh, one of our design principles was one entrance on this one. And so we've managed to do that and also managed to do it in a way that if we wanted to have after hours programs, this, this space can be shut down in ways um, that will allow us to still operate. Um, Chris will show you the two spots. We have a, um, a roll down grill that comes in right between the uh, lobby public services area and the collections off to the east. And then we have another um, uh, doorway there, which uh, closes off uh, again from the collections area to the east. And what basically that does is allows you to have programs in the evening. People can come in, they still have access to the restrooms. The teaching kitchen is still there if you're doing some kind of a, a, a cooking program that evening. Um, you, you've got basically two exits still, um, basically at the uh, south, the main uh, entrance, as well as over at the staff um, area through there. So you still have two exits out. And there is an emergency exit that you can access at the east end. Uh, Chris will point that one out. You go that way, and that would be an emergency only exit out. So um, you can uh, basically limit the number of staff at that point um, uh, in order to uh, take advantage of those functions after hours. There's the all ages collaborative area, which is on the uh, west area and the teen center. Those two are also areas that could be accessed after hours. So, so even though, I mean, we have the the surface parking and the garage and the elevators, they all feed into one right. main entrance. Yes. So there's still one entrance. That was the challenge. One, yeah. of the cha one of the many challenges we had was how do you get everybody to land in the lobby when you're coming up from various different places? Mm -hmm. And the uh, atrium stair acted as that vehicle by which we could bring people up and land them at the uh, location, at a, at a common location. Mm -hmm. We lost power. Are there any other questions from the board? N now this actually, we have an action item to approve this design and move on to the next phase. Do we have a motion to approve yes, this design plan and proceed? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor of approving the design and proceeding to construction, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. <clears throat> okay. Um, and now we have a mo do we have a motion to approve a resolution declaring certain property surplus? So moved. Second. 
We have a motion and a second. Uh, these are boxes of ceiling tiles. Uh, are there any questions, discussion about this resolution? I asked Brian why we had boxes of ceiling tile, and he said it, we had so many different sizes and there's nothing in any of our buildings that have that size anymore. All in favor of approving the resolution, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. Um, and do we have a motion to approve the proposed media relations policy? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second, and it looks like uh, Greer is going to talk to us about this. Yeah, just a little bit of an overview. This new proposed policy replaces both the current policy on photography, videotaping, and use of other recording devices, and the social media policy. In terms of content, there are very few changes, but it combines the core of these two current policies with regards to filming and recording at the library and our approach to managing our social media presence. And policy condenses these previous two policies under a single vision for library media relations, allowing us to deliver a more consistent and representative message about the library and its many services while helping us to maintain a positive and inviting social media presence by making sure that abusive, illegal, and otherwise inappropriate information does not remain associated with MCPL's social media posts. Most importantly, it designates the library director, associate director, and communications and marketing manager as the principal representatives of MCPL for the purposes of media relations. So we'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Just to um, clarify again what you said, this, there's not uh, sub substantive new content here, Correct. it's just collapsing multiple previous policies into one? That's correct. Are there any questions from the board? All in favor of approving the proposed media relations policy, please say aye. aye. Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. Thank you, Greer, and everyone else who worked on this document. Um, and now our monthly update. Uh, this month from Emily Bedwell, president of the MCPL Foundation. Welcome, Emily. First of all, I thank you so much. Um, like I said, my name is Emily Bedwell, and this is my sixth year on the board. Sadly, it is my last year on the board, but I get to serve as president, so it's a great way to go out. Um, while I've been on the board for six years, I have been a friend of the library since 1997, which was the year I moved here to college from my hometown just north of Fort Wayne. Libraries have been in my blood my whole life. I'm one of those kids whose family members would take books to the movies to read until the lights went out. So it comes naturally. So I started on the board after the John Lewis Power of, Word of Words event several years ago. I was asked by a current board member if I would consider serving. I had no idea what I was getting into, but it has been the most fulfilling five plus years of my life. Um, the Friends of the Monroe County Public Library, the foundation, if you don't know, our official mission right off the website is we support the mission, vision, and values of the library. The Friends advocate for library and support the library collections, services, programs, and staff development. So what that sounds like to me is that the, the foundation exists for fundraising. And it does. But a broader scope, and my mission as the president, is to really increase advocacy for the library. I want the people walking down the street that are playing on the bears to know what the library is about. I want new people in our community from the international students who get to call Bloomington home for just a few months or a few years to people like me who become transplants after college to know that their public library is really for them. We do that through a lot of different ways. We do that through fundraising, which is the one that you know. The Campaign for Excellence, which has been our yearly fundraising campaign, was recently renamed the Annual Fund Drive with the F-U-N is like all exciting and pretty. Um, membership dues, one-time gifts, and bequests and from people who have passed away. There are currently 752 people that are on our friends roster as members or, board or donors. 
the little bit of a difference there is whether they have said they want to be a friend or whether they just want to give us their money. 752 people. Our membership start at just $25 a month. So we are making, or $25 a year, a month would be great. So we're making big differences. What I want to continue to do in Bloomington is for people to see the library. Once I get so excited about this branch as a truly a third space, a place where well, the community can come together. It's the last truly free and truly safe place for honest discourse and discussion, especially in towns like this. So we, in, we increase awareness through monthly dine-outs. I hope you guys all participate. Uh, D'Angelo's next Tuesday and the Tuesday after that. These, we partner with restaurants and they give us a little bit of money. And last year we raised, I think, just over $3,500 in a pandemic for the library through just eating out. Uh, coffee with friends, power of words, and other programs. So as we look to the future, we're excited to support this new branch. And we're voting on a dollar amount that the foundation wants to give the branch at our next meeting, which is next week. While I can't get, share a specific number with you because it hasn't been approved, we do want to give generously, and we have been very excited. I was a little nervous going in, like, what's the board going to say? What are we going to be willing to give? And the overwhelming response was, this is why we have this money. This is why we have this time. And we want to be a part of the process. So personally, I'm a huge believer of the library as a place of connection, communication, and community goodness. So as I go through the year, I would love to partner with each of you to learn a little bit more about what the friends do and how they can be a part of your community too. I want us to work together and what my passion that I've shared with Marilyn and Greer in our meetings is I want the friends and the staff of the library to work better together to understand each of our roles in serving our community. So as we look to the future, here's some things you can expect from the board. We're dedicating to diversifying our board both in race, in gender, and in age. When I joined the board five years ago, I was the youngest person there by probably 15 years. And like, luckily we have a couple IU students now on our board and a couple people that have kind of changed who we are a little bit. Uh, we wanna energize young, younger generations to become friends. $25 a year isn't a lot of money, $35 for you and your spouse, that kind of stuff. We want people to continue to see the friends as an important part of, of their giving. And we want to take those people that are on our roles, those 752 people, and make them active participants in the friends and in the life of the library. So we're gonna look at ways not only to raise more money, but for people to be more aware of what the library does and why it serves communities. And I had a conversation this week with someone, I was working at the vaccine clinic, about why, are, why is the library opening a new branch? Don't they have enough, or is that necessary? And I said, well, here's the thing. It's a whole new part of our community, and it's not just about books. The days when libraries were just about books are long gone, and she was shocked to realize the number of things that the library does, even in a pandemic, to help. So that's just a little bit about the friends, um, who we are, what we do. It has been a complete honor to be here tonight. I've, I, I feel like I got the inside look. Um, so if anybody has any questions about the friends, I would be happy to entertain them, or if you would like to talk to me after the meeting. We're here for you, the friends really do have the best interests of the library at heart and sometimes you forget just like how passionate a bunch of people in a room can be about the library till you sit in on a board meeting. So that's all I have. If anyone has any questions, I would be happy to entertain them. Questions for Emily? Fred was gonna clap. I think that's a good. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, all of us have, uh, here uh, tonight have been on the board for many years and we've had the pleasure over the years of uh, hearing over and over again, you know, how much the foundation does for the library in the many ways the library benefits and then through the library, the community benefits. So thank you very much for your work and uh, to everyone on the board and all. And all the friends uh, who are involved with the foundation. The checkout desk on the first or second floor. Patrons using library computers are reminded that the computers will shut down a few minutes before closing. Thank you for coming to the Monroe County Public Library today. My wife and I almost every go, go to your uh, selected restaurant almost every single time. We love to do it. We'll be at D'Angelo's soon. <laughs> well, thank you again, Emily. Um, 
It's now time for public comment. Are there any members of the public who would like to address the board? Any public online, Greer? Do we have any members of the public online who would like to speak? We do not. Then do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor of adjourning, please say aye. 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 We're adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.